So welcome to the panel on social impact and giving back. I actually, this was the first thing that I decided I wanted to do today, because this is really important to me. <laughs> and then I ended up doing a lot more stuff. So I'm really excited to have this conversation and with these people, who you're going to meet in a second. I'll just give a quick rundown, but then I'm a little bit different than some of our other conversations. I want, um, I'm going to have them explain this, this sort of the social impact giving back part of what you do so that people can have context for the rest of the conversation. So first, uh, on my left is Davis Sensiman, who is, who is everything. <laughs> she, um, Davis Law Office. Yes. Which is also a Giant Step sponsor. Thank you very much. Yes. And you're here every year doing legal workshops. Yeah. And often on panels as well. <laughs> so thank you. We'll, we'll get back to yeah. the giving back part. And Michelle Yi, a mm -hmm. photographer, writer, artist. What am I forgetting? That's good. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then Dario Otero, who is a whole bunch of things too, but is here as the founder of Youth Lens 360. <laughs> And we go back a little way, so this makes me super happy to have you on Thank here because I feel like I get to see the growth and evolution of you. Sure. And then uh, Luis Patino, who is the owner of Cafe Racer. And we're very happy to have you here. And, and you also donated a $50 gift card for people out there. If you haven't put your name in the drawing, that's one thing you can have. So we, I wanted to do this, this conversation. I think most of the people in the room at Giant Steps are, are trying to figure out ways uh, or are motivated, I should say, to find ways to give back. I, the words just sound more trite than the actions are. But um, so I wanted to have some examples up here of people who are doing different types of things outside of sort of the standard nonprofit. I mean, I think a lot of us who either work for nonprofits or work around nonprofits, the idea is that those are the mission driven organizations. But I think we all understand that there are other types of mission driven organizations as well. And so I wanted to have a chance to feature some of those ideas. And also, you know, we're working with uh, artists and entrepreneurs, creative entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial creatives here today, too. So for Michelle especially, I wanted you to be able to share a different version. I know a lot of times artists get asked to donate their time or their work, and that's important and valuable, but I, I think we can take it even a little bit further with that. So I'm just going to have them spend a little bit of time explaining what that social giving back part of your work looks like, and then we'll dig into the questions. You want to start, Davis? Me? Yeah. Sure. Um, <laughs> so, like Susan said, we I have a law firm, um, and we um, mostly work with um, business owners and nonprofits and individuals, but we I started the, the firm because I was working at a bigger firm, and they were basically like, well, there's just something about you that, like, isn't like us, and I was like, e everything about me isn't like you. <laughs> so, so I started the firm and was just like, I don't have to do anything that I don't want to, and I don't have to work with anybody that I don't want to, and so, you know, every other law firm in the world is set up for like cis, straight, white men, um, and it's set up to serve them and to like do whatever they need and to keep them in power, and um, so we were like, well, it's not what we're going to do. And so we have kind of always just, if someone is doing something and we believe in the person or we believe in the mission, we just um, find a way to work with them. Um, and that's kind of come through just doing a lot of pro bono work or low bono work or partnering up with, um, I run the business law clinic at Mitchell. My law partner, Emily, who was here earlier, she now runs the business law clinic at the U. We just have to take control of the business law clinic at St. Thomas, and then we'll just run them all. Um, <laughs> and you know, the, the, we get to give you get to kind of pick clients for those those clinics, and so we just use that to basically work with people and businesses and organizations that like are not set up to empower cis straight white dudes because the rest of the world we is. benefited from that once we were part of one <laughs> yeah. of your clinic cases, yeah. Thanks. And, and also, can you touch on the classes that you're doing uh, through the, is it the city? Yeah. Or? So we also, so last year 
we found out about, the city has this program called BTAP, the city of Minneapolis has this program called BTAP, which is the Business Technical Assistance Program. And so we signed up to be um, providers through there. And through that, we were able to um, put on some, some classes for business owners and then also do some one-to-one -one consulting with them. And then the city um, paid the bill. Well, they haven't paid the bill yet, but <laughs> allegedly they will be paying the bill. And, uh, oh, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, and, so some, and some of that has been related to some of the social issues too, right, hasn't it? The sick and safe time, was that part oh, of that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, and, I'm just and so we, um, and so some of those um, sessions that we did were to help small business owners really get on board with like earn sick and safe time, paying 15. The things that they should, you know, if, if they're, they're good people, they should want to do, but some of them are just like, I don't know how to do it. So um, those were, that was really nice because you're like helping them work towards like an actual thing that will benefit more people. Yeah, and, and that's one reason why it caught my mind too, is because the finding the like practical implementation aspects of some of the ideas that a lot of us are invested in is important. Like that's part of how we make those things reality or make those policies work. So thank you. Yeah, uh, Michelle, do you want to describe? Tell us what Sophia is. Yes. Um, so Sophia is a woman-powered organization that works to inspire, educate, and support women working in photography. Um, so we started like in 2014 and it was just really casual like at the time you know when you're like a professional photographer at least in my own experience you're kind of working in a silo like you're just working all the time and then once in a while you emerge from your cave and you'll meet at a party you'll talk and then you'll go back to your cave and after years of doing this um, just other women we were just talking about like forming a collective like we just felt like we needed a reason to come together and um, we were missing that connection that we had in school you know where people were like sharing their work in progress talking about concepts getting feedback and we really wanted to capture some of that again and so when we got together like we had a really loose idea of what this was even going to be um, but i'm like no we're going to have a show and you know, we're gonna put it all out there. And um, I didn't realize how much of an impact that would have, uh, especially on my own life. So, because when I first started the collective, I wasn't like the person who started it. When we started it together, um, I felt like I didn't know how I got that seat at the table. All the other photographers were very established, like advertising commercial photographers. They were winning awards. And I was doing good work, but I was like under the radar. I wasn't entering contests. I wasn't really putting myself out there in a larger way. Um, but I felt like I was being mentored by these other women. So by showing them work that I previously thought was like too dark or people will know I'm lonely or something, like <laughs> they just made me feel really seen and they uh, made my ideas seem valid and um, that was a gift that they gave to me that I never anticipated and I don't think I can ever pay back so um, one of the things that I'd always heard over and over is like you know the more like more that you're given the more is, ex is expected of you and when I saw people resonating with the work that we'd made at our first group show and how much these like younger photographers were looking to us um, I just really felt personally compelled to do something to give back to our community so um, one of the things that we're really focused on now is um, our mentorship program so We've just finished like one year of mentoring, the eight of us mentored 17 photographers, and now we want to open it up so it's not just Sophia members acting as mentors, but we want to um, expand to include other photographers who are working in other mediums. Maybe they're not commercial, but they're fine art or they're weddings, or you know, there's so many different ways of making a living this, in this industry, but it's not a clear cut path. So I just feel like the more paths that we can show to people, the larger ripple effect that it'll have. And you mentioned to me once about when you opened up the mentoring, uh, like the number of applications you got versus what you thought you were going to get. Yeah, it was, uh, I mean, we were just like out of the gates, no one really knew us, and the fact that we had like 50 people apply, um, I just really saw that there was a need, and I thought, well, there's only eight of us, like we can't take on every single person here, but I feel really responsible for them. So. Um, that's part of the reason why I really want to try to expand the program and not just limit it to us who are like sort of running the show because there's so many other people who um, have the power to you know positively impact other people's lives and I if Sophia can be like that touch point where those connections are made that would be really gratifying for me and you're still doing your own photography work 
I am. as well. Yes, yes. That's probably the reason why we haven't done more things is that, you know, as a freelancer, like, it's all hustle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, having to, like, take the time to, like, have meetings, talk about, like, what's important to us, how we're going to do this, like, all the logistics of putting things together. And we're, like, quite frankly, there's, now there's only six of us, and we're in three different cities in two different time zones, so there's a lot of logistical challenges even just getting us together. So um, right now I just feel like if I focus on the mentorship program... You know, it's like all the work is kind of up front, but once those connections are made, like those are some year-long relationships that will evolve on their own. That's great. And I think that that, um, the idea of how are we helping folks coming up behind us is a really important one that I know a lot of people also in the Giant Steps community are invested in. And so I want to keep also bringing that up in ways that we can, we can do that. And that is what you're doing too, Dario, right? Yeah. So... so yeah, Youth Lens 360. Youth Lens 360 is a youth marketing company. Uh, young people uh, 14 to 24 can get involved. Uh, we work with high schools, in high school mostly, but uh, the 18 to 24 range, uh, we work with at the Impact Hub downtown Minneapolis. That's where our office is. And young people get involved and in any way they want to. Uh, we use the cameras and the video production stuff as a tool, uh, but the real secret sauce is like they're all starting their own businesses. So every young person that comes in is encouraged to start their own business, uh, whether they choose to do that after Youth Lens, that's up to them. Uh, but shooting for that high mark of entrepreneurship uh, makes you, uh, you know, so much more powerful in everything that you do. Um, and the impact piece, I think, comes really in just opening up doors and spaces for young people to get into. Uh, that normally they may not be invited into, and the magic happens there because uh, once the uh, door is open, everybody can see that it's an even playing field, and young people bring their brilliance into the room. Uh, and I don't, I don't think I purposely knew to do it that way. I kind of stumbled on it, and I got to tell a little story about Susan. So oh. I'm not trying, trying to get emotional. Uh, but uh, when I came here in 2009 uh, from Detroit, I was just literally coming, and I was a music video director dude, but I got an opportunity to work at a high school. And uh, one of the first people that I met was Susan. Uh, there was a disaster that happened, uh, the Haiti... Um, uh, Hurricane, yeah. Earthquake. Earthquake, I'm sorry. And uh, the young people were mobilized really by Susan talking about what can we do about this disaster. And they mobilized together and worked together to form a song. And I think that permeated through the young people to not only do a song, but do a video. And that went on and on. And at the time, I think YouTube was really young and not a lot of people posted a ton of stuff up. Uh, but we did a from song to video in 24 hours and posted it online over like 400,000 views in probably a couple weeks. And I think uh, what what we realized was like that young people can make an impact, but you passed that on to me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even realize it until a couple of days ago. I said, well, when I really start like not just being this music video director shooting like raunchy videos. <laughs> And when did I come over to this side where I was like working with young people doing like powerful stuff and it, I, I realized it was that moment. So, um, yeah, so you pass that impact down to me, but I pass mm-hmm. the impact on and I think that's what's, what's so special about you, Plans 360. Thank you for that. That's mm-hmm. not why I invited you to be up here. But, <laughs> but I, I do remember when we were sitting in, this, in the post-production area and you, I think you had your mom on the phone and you were like, this is the first video that I'm proud to show my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Like, thank you. I was like, yeah, so anybody that's looking up my name and trying to find oh, my sorry. old stuff, like, I'm just you're not going to find I'm, it. Sorry. I'm, I'm <laughs> outing everybody today, apparently. So, right. sorry. Uh, Luis, do you want to explain what you're doing at Cafe Racer besides providing delicious food? No, of course. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here. And um, just, it's really an honor to be sitting up here with such amazing individuals and be here surrounded by such amazing people. It's it, being an entrepreneur and... Um, Finding the motivation to do what you love every single day isn't always necessarily easy, but surrounding yourself with good people and finding the motivation and the people that inspire you to do that is definitely um, is definitely awesome to be here. Um, but yeah, so I own a restaurant and food truck called Cafe Racer Kitchen, right just down the street here in the Sewer neighborhood of Minneapolis. Um, I started about six years ago, and uh, the restaurant's been around for about three and a half years. We uh, serve. Latin American style cuisine, um, specifically Colombian uh, food, that's where I'm from. Uh, I started this uh, once a month free meal called Break Bread. 
um, where from the last Monday of every month from uh, 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., no questions asked, we serve anyone who's coming in a free meal. Um, just, and I, I pay my staff, my chefs to be there. Sometimes we have volunteers, other chefs, other servers that will just come in. Um, but what it is, I, I believe for me, it was a reaction to the first break bread happened the day after the 2016 election. And I just, I, I, I got up that day and I just like felt a overwhelming need to surround myself and the people around me with the only love I could give um, at the moment, which was food. You know, that's all I could muster myself to do is just get in the kitchen and do what I love. And I just put a, you know, I just put a message out. If you need, if you need a space, if you need time, uh, if you need to be surrounded by, by, if you just need to talk, come on in today. And I started doing it the next month and the next month, and it's, it'll be two years now, uh, this November. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity because it reminds me, uh, every, it's my favorite day every month because I wake up, it'll be this Monday, so if anybody <laughs> is hungry, please. Um, uh, and it's, and it's, you have to trick Minnesotans into receiving a free meal. We're, we're not. <laughs> we're not <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> We're not, we're, not, we're, uh, we're not an easy people to help. Um, uh, we're very, mid Midwesterners and Minnesotans are very proud, so I, it, it's, it's amazing. You have to actually like, train the staff and volunteers to have it be an experience just like any other day at the restaurant. Because if you were to tell just uh, your average Minnesotan that's walking down the street, please come on in and have a free meal, they're not going to take it because they feel that they're actually taking something away from somebody else when in reality you're, you're adding something, you're, you're adding community, you're adding presence. And, and you know, now we get so busy that we just have to sit people together in the, you know, in the same tables, you know, which is, which is great because you have neighbors that have, that have lived right down the street that get a chance to actually sit together and share a meal and, and break bread. And, and um, that's just my small grain of uh, sand in the bucket of the amazing good deeds that everyone here does. And really, it's just, it, it's just the idea of using the resources that are available to me to do the, the, the least that you know, one can do with what one has. So thanks for having me here, Susan. And I think, um, you know, by highlighting these folks, they're obviously not the only people in the room who are doing amazing things, but I just, there were just little angles on each story that I wanted to be able to show. And I, like starting with you, I mean, the restaurant business isn't an easy business, and it's not a high margin business. So I think that is a situation where a lot of people would say, like, there's no way you could do what you do, but you're, you've been doing it for two years. How does, has, how, like, what's your answer to that? Or when other people tell you, did anybody tell you you were, mistaken I, to try to do something like this? 100%. You, I've actually got pushback from other restaurant owners. Um, mm -hmm. uh, just because it's like the, the idea of it is somewhat difficult when you, when you work, like you said, with such low profit margins, but just don't pay yourself as much from the beginning or just mm -hmm. don't think that you're doing it for whatever reason you're doing. I mean, I just come from, I might have just not have had the same perception as another individual. I'm from Colombia, from like, and I, my parents I've had a ton of privilege in my life. I'm very blessed to be able to have very educated parents that we never came from money, but we, we came from the idea of supporting each other and providing each other with, with the knowledge and information that one needs to help the world around you. You know, it's the idea of the moment that you have enough, you're supposed to share anything extra. Um, that, that, that refers to everything. It's the idea of, of having, of having um, more than what one needs is never a concept that I've, like even within business, even it's important to understand that money is a tool and that you have to make profits. And trust me, I've become an accountant, a carpenter, a janitor, a plumber, all of these things. You, you learn all these things as you uh, own a business. But the reality is, is a reminder as to what's important, as to why it is that you're doing, the why you get up in the morning, um, the, what brings you joy. Mm -hmm. uh, because happiness is actually not that important. Um, uh, it's the joy, it's the things that like, that like keep you going, the things that keep you alive. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's the difference right there. And also what I heard you say too is like building it in. Like it's not a question of like, oh, if we have time, we'll do this, or if we have extra money, we'll do this. But it sounds like it's just built into what you're doing now. I, I mean, it's there already, no matter what. It, and if you think that you can't take what you do and help out another individual, that you're, you're, you're approaching it. If you ever want to do anything other than make money, mm -hmm. right, you're doing it for the world around you. You're doing it to try to make the world hopefully a little bit better place, a little bit more comfortable for someone else other than
other than yourself. Mm -hmm. Ideally, of course, you have to take care of yourself first. But but the moment you have you know that structure, that support system, you would the, the knowledge and the information and the and the personal strength, which is not every day, it, you lose that. You will fall and falter. Like you've heard every individual here say that it is not easy to maintain that focus, but. Um, the the focus and the, the the purpose is to make the world around you a little bit easier for those that are next to you. That's good. Because you can. Yeah. Right. Good. And I think um, Dario, for you too, one of the reasons that I wanted. I mean, I love what you're doing. You talked about getting people or getting youth into spaces. You've been at the Capitol. Yeah. Uh, you've done some stuff for Melvin Carter, right? Uh, well, we got did the interview. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, but we, we did a lot of work with the state. Uh, we did a lot of work with the city. Um, we're doing work with a lot of organizations around the city and, you know, this recent, like, Startup Week. I was just going to say Startup Week, yeah. Yeah, Techstars, Blacks in Tech, um, yeah, ACLU. I mean, it goes on and on and on. But what, what the magic is, is, like, young people actually doing the work. So, right. like... They come and they want to deal with me, and then once they realize I'm just going to middleman the work and give it back to the youth, yeah. then they then they're like, oh, the young people can really do this, you know? Yeah. And uh, I think that's the magic, and um, you know, it's nothing that you know schools taught them or anything. It's just their natural ability and and and, and uh, natural creativity that I think people overlook so much. Mm -hmm. um, and they are when you give them the tools to do the work, then they can do it. So I mean, nobody's waking up in the morning and just like, I'm just gonna do negative today. If I can give you something positive <laughs> to do, you know, um, you're gonna do it. Uh -huh. uh, but if there's not enough positive doors open and not enough things for people to, young people to do, then that's what you see on the news. So uh, the story is changing though. And I think that, uh, you know, just the people on this panel are, you know, we're able to just bit by bit change what we're, you know, what the world sees here. And you had some folks on the news this week? Is that yeah, right? uh, so I got a shout in out. In a positive story. I got a shout out IWD in the house. If I mean, stand up if you're IWD. Yes. So. <laughs> and yes. Some, some of you guys were here last year too, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I nice. got to say, I learned more from them. They, oh, yeah, you can get some business cards too. <laughs> nice. so, uh, but, you know, they're just, a, uh, they have an amazing story. I'm not going to tell it for them, but individuals with dreams, they came together and they're making, you know, dreams come true. <laughs> And uh, they have some events coming up on the third and the fifth this week, all around like going to vote and like put down the guns, not violence. And sometimes I think the community thinks that they have to come in and do that work, and you know, you know, some organization has to come and do that work. But the young people doing that work is what makes a change. Like mm -hmm. I can't reach the people they can reach. So yeah, um, powerful stuff from IWD. And they were, they, there was a CARE 11 break the news story that was talking about your entrepreneurship, right? Which is fantastic. Yeah. I, you know, I'm biased, but I like to see that kind yeah, of, all that of, kind of information. Yeah. So, um, and Michelle, you, ta you touched on this, but like how it is when you're working for yourself to carve out that time to work on other things, what, what is the mental conversation or the conversation you have with yourself in order to do that? Uh, well, I'm a big believer that whatever you put out into the world will come back to you. So I don't actually know if this is going to come back to me monetarily, but um, it's not really about that for me. Mm -hmm. Like I think, you know, for a while, like I was working and I was busy as a photographer and I just really found myself questioning, like, what is success? Like, is it just enough to be making money as a photographer and this is kind of it? Like I really felt like I wanted my life to have more meaning than that. Um, so... I just, so a little story is mm -hmm. uh, we have a, an Instagram account and we've been opening it up to our mentees to take over and I've been working with this one mentee and you know she was a social worker, she's never shown her work before. I asked her like, because we had like kind of a pretty detailed like application process because we wanted to just know where you're at as a photographer mm -hmm. and her work was beautiful and her writing was something that really resonated with me and it totally caught me off guard when she said like, I'd never shown anybody that ever before. Mm. And I just thought about the opportunity that I had with Sophia where I was also making work that no one had ever seen and I just thought I have to work with her because who knows how long it'll be until this next opportunity will come for her to share this work. Anyhow, she, um, through the course of our mentorship program, I didn't actually know this until she showed me the work, but she'd actually um, been sexually assaulted and she was creating she was writing about it and she was taking really personal photos and she shared it on our Instagram account. And I was like, 
I didn't even know what to say, you know, I think because I'm not a social worker, you know, and I knew that like I can't hold the space for her, so I was clear to say like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do my best as like your mentor in photography. So I'm gonna trust that you're gonna speak to someone who can take care of what you're going through and I'm just gonna try to help you as best I can with this. But I just wanted to be clear because I didn't want to say anything that could harm her or anything and it just felt like a really big responsibility. But she shared this beautiful story that was, anyway, I'm not gonna cry. I told myself I wasn't gonna cry, but, um, it was really powerful and really beautiful, and she sent me this really wonderful note thanking me um, because I, she said that I helped her find the courage to share this work. And that for me was like all the validation I needed to know that I had been able to m help someone share who they were just by sharing who I was. Mm. That's great. Thanks. <laughs> now I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Uh, here, I'll do my left brain switch for you. <laughs> we have uh, Davis is here for two reasons. One is because she's running a business that's doing this kind of stuff. Also because you have some subject matter expertise that's related to this. Um, so I, I wanted you, and probably some folks in the audience already know, but there are different sort of legal entities related to this. And I think, so one of the questions, or one of the ideas that I wanted to come out of this panel is that you don't necessarily have to have a nonprofit to make these kinds of things happen. And and Dari, yours is an LLC. You're a for-profit company, I assume, right? Correct. Considering switching Allegedly. into a B Corp. Okay, and so that's yeah, and so that's what I would. If you could just give us like a short rundown of what the options are. There's nonprofit. There's LLC or sole proprietorship. And in Minnesota, there's B Corp, which is a. Well, you explain what it is. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so there, a lot of people think that sometimes, like if you're doing a thing or if you're gonna have a mission that you have to set up a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to, and I always say like, well, are people going to give you money? And are they not going to give you money if you're not a nonprofit? And like a lot of the times it's like, oh, I don't know. You know, like, and there are some places that are not gonna give you money if you're not a nonprofit. And if that's the, the deal, then let's set up a nonprofit. It mm -hmm. doesn't have, if you're setting up from scratch most of the time, there's a new shorter form, so it doesn't have to okay. take too long. Um, but there are also like for-profit entities. Like you can just be a sole proprietor just doing your thing. You can be an LLC, you can be a corporation. And those, you can run them with a mission, mm -hmm. but not necessarily be, and I think that that's kind of the broader category of like social enterprise that mm -hmm. people talk about. Like just businesses that you're running that like have a, a mission, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you can do that. Yeah. Um, the, the deal with the Benefit Corp, the reason they exist is because, get ready, because it's yeah. going to get really nerdy. So <laughs> corporations, <laughs> like I could really get, I could really get on a soapbox about this. Corporations are created to maximize profits for their shareholders. So this is also why you can't ever solve social problems by giving money to businesses. Um, right, I'm done there. Um, and that's so an, because that's an, important, that's, that's an important footnote for this conversation Because too. Um, that's their job. Like, uh, if you are a shareholder in a company and you think that the people running the company are not maximizing profits, you have a legal cause of action to sue them. Um, and so the issue arose when there were businesses that were like, hey, I want to do a good thing but I also have shareholders and I don't want them to sue me because I'm putting a thing in front of making a profit. Like I'm putting, giving, feeding people in front of making a profit or I'm putting, so they created um, kind of like state by state, they created benefit corporations, which basically the, the whole idea is I'm either going to put one specific thing or a general thing, so we have general and specific benefit corporations in front of making profits for this corporation. So that's really all that a B Corp is. For some reason in Minnesota, and I, keep, I need to like look up why this is, um, we treat B Corp, some legislator must have not wanted us to have B Corps because if, you, if your LLC or your corporation, like you don't renew it, you pay like $40, $50 and you renew it and then you're fine. If you don't file your report, and you don't have to do a report for LLCs or corporations, but if you don't file your benefit corporation report that says like, here's the good I did, here's, you immediately, there's no grace period, you immediately go out of compliance and you have to pay $500 oh, wow. to get it reinstated. So we often will like talk folks through like, what's the reason that you wanna have a benefit mm -hmm. corporation? And like sometimes it's like, because I think it's gonna give me, a, you know, like 
for a lot of people, it's like, because I have a mission and yeah. I want people to, like, I want that to be okay. But if you don't have shareholders, right. or if you're the only one, or if it's just you and your business partners, you might not need to be a benefit I mean, we had that conversation yes. a couple of years ago. I have that conversation a lot. Yeah. I'm like, hold on. And so my, yeah, for me, it wasn't the right decision, or at least not right, right now. But right. we, and we also have had, I don't know if they're still here, but Can Can Wonderland was one of the first B Corps, mm-hmm. I think. Um, in Minnesota, so there's examples around. Yeah, here. yeah, and so it's it's really like, but it doesn't mean that like if you're not a B Corp, you're not like doing good things. doing good things. <laughs> and it's really like a, um, you know, it's the the same um, like it's it's a consideration for each business. Mm-hmm. And like we have some clients who we've decided they've decided they should be a B Corp, and I'm like, yeah, this makes sense for you because, you know of whatever reason, Mm -hmm. but you kind of have to walk it through. And we always tell folks like, just because you're organized some other, like I like to make it as easy as possible for the person doing it. So they don't have other extraneous stuff to deal with. And like, say like, let's just, let's just tell people Mm -hmm. about the good that you're doing, you know? And, and Minnesotans aren't good about telling people, like, I feel like it's our job as (laughs) their attorneys to tell people like, do you know the good stuff our clients are doing? Because like, (laughs) they're, you know, they're a humble people. Yes. Well, and I think we talked about this yeah. when you first started because you made a decision to make your organization a for-profit. Yeah, it's just all I ever knew. And, and so, almost everybody else who does things similar to what you do, do it as a non-profit. Yeah, so many people tried to push me into that lane and said, well, why aren't you a non-profit? And, you know, if you're doing all this stuff, why aren't you a non-profit? And, and then B Corp came up too, and I was just like, well, that's too complicated. I don't even understand that. <laughs> and then I was just like, well what's wrong with me just like making money and then I get to do what I want to do with my money. Like, you know, and that means, you know, if young people need something, if there's equipment that people need, if there's stuff that we have to do, I believe that putting that out into the world that it comes back, you know, anyway. So like, you know, we just become a better company when young people own their own equipment or you could dispatch young people to different jobs and now you got two jobs going on. And I just saw that as like, you know, in my community, you know, uh, when you're young, the dude who gives out the candy to everybody, you know, who knows what he's doing to get the money, but you know what I mean? Like, there was always somebody there that took care of the community, right? And so, like, just take care of the community. Like, who cares about, like, the, the taxes and the way you file them? I mean, I, I do care about the taxes. No. <laughs> I don't care about the taxes. No, no, we got, cut the camera. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but everybody, you know, you, you find different ways to get around that too. So it's like, why not just take care of the community, right? And do what you're supposed to do. Not, not knocking it, like, right, because B Corp is an option, but, you know, I I'm just, a for profit right now yeah, as well. Yeah, so, I, know, I mean, it's, like, it's, it's a consideration. Yeah it's, a, yeah, it's a consideration. But I just, I felt that, you know, I didn't have to go down that road just because everybody's trying to push me there. And I think it's like a Minnesota thing. It, the, it know? is kind of the land of nonprofits yeah. in some ways. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's fine. There are a lot of really good nonprofits doing good work. But I, did, I do like the idea of just not assuming that if you're trying to do something for your community, that you should be a nonprofit, right? right. And there's and there are organizations that will like lend their nonprofit status, like Springboard oh, right. is sponsors. like a fiscal, like that's always an option too. Like yes. if you're doing something and you're like, I don't know if this is gonna work or not, or if it's gonna be long term or not. Like if somebody's saying, I'm only gonna give you money if like there's a nonprofit aspect to it. There are places like Springboard and other mm-hmm. places that can offer you basically to be under their nonprofit umbrella, which is what we often tell clients. Like, just go do that until you're sure you need to be mm-hmm. a nonprofit. Because, like, also, there are nonprofits. People make a lot of money in nonprofits. Like, there's they're not some, all good. And there, Yeah, there's some nonprofits <laughs> where people get paid a lot of money, yeah, too, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And they don't all do good stuff. Like, no. it's just because you're a nonprofit, it's not like, oh, good, thank goodness. Yes. <laughs> I, I got to just say one more thing for the community that I like to work with, right? Like the, the young people that you see out here in the crowd, there's something about being for profit in this community that, that we're in where they need to see that yeah. because you don't just have to be a nonprofit to be able to do stuff in that community. And I think more young people need to see that you can be for profit so that they can start businesses, they can hire who they want to, nobody's controlling the way that the money flows in their community and then that sustains community, right? And yeah, and that's why I was drawn to what you were doing too, because yeah. that's the same conversation we had when we started Giant right. Steps. Is that we wanted to make sure that uh, the conversation was such that it's like it's okay to make money. That's one of the things, right? right. Mm-hmm. And also, I mean, we want people to be responsible. We want people to live their values. There's, there's a whole bunch of other conversations that go with that, um, but also that there is some benefit in showing that there are different ways right. to look at running a business than maybe is the default way. And that's why all of you are up here, because 
you're trying to, you're doing things that are a little bit different or outside the traditional version of things. How are we doing on time? Oh, all right. So <laughs> we should open it up for questions. And I totally got us nerded out out of that <laughs> emotional moment that we had. <laughs> Any questions for these folks? There's a hand up over there. I have an expectation for Louis. I have an expectation, because last year you were like, you raised your hand and asked one of the questions right away. You have a question now? Um, oh. All right. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything, but I'm going to put you on the spot. Sorry. Um, what are the new tax implications for raising money or for nonprofits or otherwise where they, they're not going to be tax deductible anymore? Um, how is that impacting fundraising in general for nonprofits? And just on the side, I don't, under, I don't understand the for-profit uh, organization that's doing, you know, <laughs> charity work. So how do you make your money? That's yeah, so uh, if you're asking me, yes. uh, I, I think I should just get the money and then hire somebody really smart to figure that out. Because I don't, I don't know it myself, but what I know is this. Um, we make money because we contract with companies young people coming into that space, learning from that, training on that, and then starting their own business eventually gives back to the community. Um, but we make our money just like anybody else. We have to go chase RFPs and chase you know, different agencies that are giving out that money, but we're changing our focus now to be like, how can we then create a product that is something more than just like the natural business of just chasing you know, RFPs, but how can young people create something that other businesses see as a value come to us and then they buy that product from us instead of us, you know, feeling like we're special because we got a contract from them, you know. So that's what we're working on right now with the something we call Team Studio. So um, I could, that's a whole other subject. But, and you're doing work, work for hire and things oh, yeah. like that, right? So that's oh, yeah, the revenue. All, uh, it's all work for hire. It's yeah. like that you, but you have this model carved out behind that that puts, it makes you different than some of your competitors. True. I think the fact that, you know, young people bring so much creativity into the room is why people hire us over and over and over again because um, I think that's the biggest export of the community of color is creativity. And for so long, we just give it away. But how can we then retain that um, and make people pay what they should pay for it instead of just giving it out? Um, you don't have to wait till we become a next NBA star uh, to be able to say you're marketable now and how can we use that creativity in a way that uh, we can do it because uh, you can now look up to people like Mondo the Black Tech Guy who is a tech guy and he is now opening up doors in the tech space for the community so you could be the next app developer instead of being the next NBA or whatever else you know, rapper that the community, not knocking rappers, Louie, but you know what I mean? <laughs> using that rap knowledge to then make money in marketing or tech or whatever other avenues open up. And the tax question? Oh, the tax question. Um, so, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know specifically what nonprofit question, like, you're thinking of. I mean, there have been a lot of um, changes and, and, but, Nonprofit, like giving to a nonprofit, is still tax deductible. Um, but I mean, the, I, I just feel like I can't really answer that question. And I would refer you to the to the tax. Folks. It's happening right now. Yeah. On the other side of that wall. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there another question over here? All right, um, so my question is actually for all of you. You can answer it individually, but I'll just wonder, like, what are some of the pitfalls or challenges you've all um, encountered in your journey of being entrepreneurs, and what's some advice you can give to some young folks like us coming up um, doing the same work? Um, I remember getting laughed at a few times first first time I went to a bank and told them I wanted to put a kitchen in a FedEx truck. Because um, it sounds ridiculous, you know? It's like, what do you, you, you want to put a kitchen on wheels? Um, that's, that's dumb, that's never gonna work. Um, a lot of that is just knowing that if you have an idea and something that you believe in and something that you can 
do that you want to get better at and improve and, and, and provide to the world, um, do it. Just, just legitimately put yourself out there and know that there is a language that, you, that you're gonna need to learn how to speak that you haven't figured out yet. There's a language out there that I didn't know. Like, it's called counting. <laughs> Seriously, I'm not kidding. Learn, like, like, learn what an income statement is. Learn what a balance sheet is. Learn what like, assets versus liabilities mean. Don't expect that you're just gonna be able to hire an accountant because you yourself are taking your idea. If you want a bank to give you money, right, to, to start a business and you don't have anything to start off with but yourself, okay, don't let that intimidate you because you can get there. You can make anything it is that you can imagine happen because someone else has probably already done it before you with less. Um, I love this state. This state is amazing. It gave me everything and anything I could have ever wanted. Something about this place is just beautiful here. Um, yes, it's cold and it is a little, like I would say, not as tan as I would have like, liked, um, but, but that doesn't, that doesn't, I mean, that, that you have to understand, I wanted to, a quick story if I can, like yeah. two seconds. Um, I remember, I'm from Colombia, I'm an immigrant, and originally we had to come here, you know, to, for our appointments for the immigration office before I got, before my family got our green card. Um, we would have to go to the um, uh, Bloomington Immigration Office during the middle of the winter. It doesn't matter if it was negative 30 degrees, you'd have to wait out there because before they had appointments, you know, in a line of 200 people all waiting first come, first serve. Um, and I remember like being seven years old and just having to freeze out there, you know, just hopefully to get an appointment that day. And this was back in the day when Paul Wellstone was still around and his bus showed up to that, to that event. And that guy came out and like brought up blankets and coffee and hot chocolate and tents and blankets. And I realized at that moment that like there is a people that care about you here. This is a place where like not every single person might like like believe the same things that you do, but they will help you get to the place where you want to get to. Um, and he always had a quote um, that like, honestly, to this day, I can never forget where it's just, let there be no space between the words you say and the life you live. Mm. So, yeah. mm. That's a good quote. <laughs> uh, answering the question to the young people, I would say just go back to that place of uh, just like passion. Um, like when you're young, you start a lemonade stand or you know, you put a bunch of cereal in a bag and then you sell it at the school, right? Like sugar or whatever you mixed your Kool-Aid up, thanks, yeah. <laughs> you sell it at the school, right? Like go back to that passion that said like, Here's a resource, I wanna make money, how do I, how do, I do that, right? Um, and somewhere in education, unfortunately, it kills that spirit and it just tells you to follow the path and follow the system. And if you are outside of that system, that you're wrong. Um, but go back, go back to that passion and then figure and find your passion that you wanna do for the world and use that same model. It's as easy as the lemonade stand, so. Oh, some really good advice here. Um, I think that, uh, one of my things was like the little hater mm -hmm. that uh, I talked little about hater. earlier. Um, so I think that the most important thing for young people and for anyone really is to truly, truly believe in what it is that you want to do and do not let anyone say anything to the contrary. Or if they do, don't listen. You know, like I've learned for myself, especially as a new, new person living in the US, it's like you really have to be an advocate for yourself. You have to know like what you stand for, what you believe in, you have to believe that what you have to say matters, and you have to be absolutely resilient in making that happen. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think that like we all have like, sometimes I know I should be doing that, but I don't do it. Just recognize that some of these things take time. Mm -hmm. You know, you're gonna have these doubts. If there's something that you wanna change in your life, you've been living this way up until now, and you want to do something different, just understand that you've lived your life one way, up until now, you want something different, you're gonna do something different, but it takes time to change habits. So if you wanna make a habit of really believing in yourself, like just start to like listen to the way, think, way that you talk about yourself. Like if you, if you experience a failure, don't spend any time beating yourself up on it, harvest all the good from it. So maybe I'm going all over the map, but I think that like the seed of it is, is to look for the good in everything, including yourself. And if you really root into what your mission is, what your passion is, what you know you're really good at, and if other people don't understand it, you know, be kind to yourself, stick with it, 
and people will come around. Just tell yourself, like, I'm just looking for the people who are looking for me. And you keep that high vibration, you keep putting good out into the world, you keep believing in yourself, and you will get there. I think for me it would be that just, um, like, don't assume that, like, your, like, what other people have said is, like, success mm -hmm. is how you have to be. Because for a while I feel like we fell into this tra trap of, like, oh, we have to, like, grow and we have to get bigger and we have to, like, grow as a law. And then I was like, well, this is, like, I don't want to run a law firm, like, <laughs> other people's law firms. And, like, so now it's just we're smaller and it's, like, me, Emily, and Chuck and, like, we all are like moving in the same direction and like I like I have taken time off of work to like work on like political campaigns and and like we've all kind of we can kind of dip in and out mm -hmm. of it doesn't have to be like oh this is like success is we have to be working super hard and it has to look exactly like everybody else so it's like we don't all have to strive for like scale like right. it doesn't always right. have to be like right. we have to have a hundred people and like sometimes it's like well no yeah. it'll just be the three of us yeah like I feeling think, grateful feeling grateful. Yeah, yeah yeah that's yeah. my version of success yeah. just feeling yeah. grateful yeah. exactly that's uh, i'm gonna jump in on this one too because i think everything that you've you guys have said totally makes sense and we have there are things that we've heard over and over again over now you know nine years uh, this like how you define success so it kind of for me comes down to two things knowing who you are and who you want to be and so what does that life look like which includes what kind of work do you want to do and what does your day look like even what kind of people you want to surround yourself with or be surrounded by uh, and then the the work part and what you talked about Luis, re resonated for me just actually for giant steps because when we started this in 2010 I had people tell me that we were crazy to think that uh, business and artists could learn, business people and artists could learn from each other. Like, they were just like that, that's like, sure, the artists can learn from the business people, but what can the business people learn from the artists? <laughs> and, uh, and like, I knew, like, I knew what some of those things were, and I also knew it was true. And it's, it's interesting now, eight years later, because that's like a super trendy conversation, right? Now every conversation about entrepreneurship has artists in it, and like Forbes has a regular beat covering creative entrepreneurs and things like that. So it is partly what you were talking about. Like if you know that this is what you want to do, you also have to, you have to learn the language like of accounting and other things that you don't know. But you also have to learn how to not get swayed by people or dissuaded by people, but also how do you articulate your vision to other people so that they can start to come along with you, right? So, so sometimes that is new language. Sometimes it's trying to draw analogies. Sometimes you have to just show by doing it, which is kind of what we've done. Um, but that that thing about like don't lose like don't lose sight of it just because you're getting people pushing back. Uh, sometimes those people just aren't there yet, right? So if you have an idea, and I know some of you are especially creative in the room, so like if you have an idea like that, hold on. It doesn't mean be rigid about it and don't be flexible to input or whatever. But don't necessarily let go of it just because nobody else can see what you see because you might be ahead of the curve. So discipline over motivation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Any more questions? Yeah. Hey y'all. Um, I think my question is just around navigating the space of living living in a capitalistic world. And wanting, like I have a couple different projects I'm starting, one is a nonprofit that is really big and then the other thing is a, a for-profit endeavor. Um, and like I really wanna live into that quote by Wellstone, which is a famous quote, but then I think about the fact that like my salary and the salary of all of my staff right now comes from an endowment whose investments, it's like blood money, right? But that's how we're surviving. So the nuance for me around like how do I, and as I look at this, uh, for-profit endeavor um, around, you know, we're really clear we want this business to be about connecting people and we have all these other ideas, but then, like, I got bills to pay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just a, it's a struggle that as we're in this formation phase that I just wonder how you navigate that because um, the reality is we live under capitalism and we are reliant on the very structures some of us are trying to tear down. So what does that look like? It's just a tool. Just if I've, the moment I was able to separate myself from the, the concept of having the amount of money one has in one's bank account or one's business and versus 
it just being a tool to get from point A to point B, the moment I stopped stressing about it and being able to focus on getting more of it. Um, it it's, 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 if, if you focus so much time on what it is you think you don't have, you don't actually realize all the amazing things you have around you and all the resources you have and all the amazing people you have to get to whatever thing you want to get to. It is incredible the potential that an individual has to get things done if you just don't stress about things that don't matter, that aren't even actually real. Like you said, blood money, I believe, right? It's, that's real, that's a real thing. There's, like, there's a guilt that I feel oftentimes when I'm able to live the extremely privileged life that I get to live, right? To get the benefits of being able to pass on so many different ways of being a man in this society, okay? Like, like I feel legitimately guilty about that. The fact that like, I just can walk down the street and not feel the same certain fears as an individual next to me. Um, you, you have to realize that those, those things are aspects that are going to be there no, no matter what. And, and you have the ability to take all the community and resources that you have around you to, to, to build the thing that you want to build, to help the people that you can, because creating, creating a job, creating a nonprofit creates opportunities for people, creates jobs, creates different aspects, creates hopes and dreams, this joy at the end of the day. What you're doing isn't going to bring you necessarily happiness all the time, right? Because like the happiness is just fleeting, right? It, it, it goes in, but 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 the purpose is the joy, right? So so if you are able to separate yourself, and it, this is really difficult because you have to become an expert at accounting and all these things. But if you just look at it like a hammer, right? It's just a tool. It's just a tool to get from point A to point B. You can do the work. You can do your accounting, and then get on to your next part. Right? Yes, it's stressful, yes, it's that, but just, just, just look at it simply as a tool. That's how I do it. I don't know how others do it, but that's what helps me. Mm. I think I, you've got to also like, give yourself permission to make money. Like, I do that. I feel like I do that a lot with my clients. Like, be like, look, this is not a bad thing. Like, you make, your mo- like, make your money, especially if you're not a cis straight white dude. Like, make <laughs> your money. Like, they're going to make their money. Yeah. Make your money and then use your money to do things, you know? Like... Like, you, you can use your money to hire, you know what I mean, to give people good jobs, yeah. but, like, it's a big thing. Like, I'm constantly telling clients, like, no, no, no. You make your money and get yourself solid, and then you're going to support other people. But, like, it is hard as, like, a woman and a person of color and, like, to be, like, I am, I can make this money and not feel guilty about it, you know? And, like, that's what you have to do, like... They don't feel guilty about making money. Totally. Yeah. Until we until we tear it all down. And then I'll <laughs> tear it all down. I think yeah. I'm really glad you asked that question because I mean that's something for me personally, but it's also something for giant steps all along. Uh, we've always said that like we aren't doing this to tell people how to get rich and famous, right? And we all are struggling how do we do the things that we're doing in this system of capitalism, even if we don't buy into it. Um, so part of it for me is making sure that we have some version of that conversation every year because it's messy. And I think the only way we know how to deal with messy is to just keep learning from each other because it's not going to get not messy very soon, right? But like the good work that's going on around cooperatives and some other things, like we can keep learning from different people. I also have a good friend who uh, keeps reminding me in different ways that the revolution is no time for ideological purity. <laughs> so, because that's, that's part of the, the thing that I get tripped up in, and I think especially as a white person too. Um, you know, whose money, absolutely, like whose money, where's the money coming from? Um, and I think it's important to be aware of that for sure. I think we could uh, maybe with ourselves and with each other be a little more nuanced about how we think about that. Um, because it's, you know, it's pretty easy to jump on a thing like that's not okay because of where that money comes from. But if we're being smart about some of that money, we can use it for good things, right? Like I think last year we had someone on the panel who was talking about like figuring out how to take some of that money, that some of that basically rich white guy money that's out there and apply it it's to building some of these businesses, to building businesses that work in different ways, to building businesses that have community around them, and, but being conscious about it, right? Not just like saying that to ease your conscience, but, but that's where some of the leverage is, right? So I, I don't think there is uh, gonna be an easy answer to that question, but I'd love that people are talking about it and I hope that we keep talking about it here in this forum every year because I think we can, we can learn from each other about that. And, and I love that you're thinking about that that way. Any other questions? Okay. 
Um, oh, so I do freelance a lot, and then I give stuff away. So I do makeup and hair, and I'll do wardrobing, etc. But my favorite saying is, people love your gifts until they have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So giving it away all the time and having that conversation with, okay, I love helping you guys, but enough is enough. What does that look like? How can people who, you know, especially young people, you know, they want to be doing something and being in the action and being a part of the scene and um, having their name put on things, etc. How do you volunteer and without burnout? How mm -hmm. do you give yourself without giving yourself? Uh, so for me, it's just simple. It's like I'm not going to hire you. I'm not going to lend you my camera. You're going to go buy your own camera with the money that you just made. You're going to start your own business. You're going to buy a pass or you're going to get a passport because that's going to open up a door to the future for you, right? Like that'll let you know that it's okay to travel. For me, I, I, I just, I know that if I'm just giving and if I'm just constantly giving you something then I'm taking something away from you and that's the ability to go get it yourself. And so, you know, the young people that I have, I don't have that problem because they really know, like, you know, if, I, if I'm giving something to you, that's because I know you need it. Like, you probably didn't even ask me, right? Like, you're, you're in a situation where I'm like, take that, and then we'll get back to it later, right? But, like, if, if, you, uh, if, if, you're, if you're working with me, if you're a young person, you're, you're probably asking for knowledge, and that's probably the most thing that I'm giving, or opportunity, or for what's, when's the next job coming up. Or if it, you know, how can I get into that door? And then once the young people that I work with get into that door, they know what to do then. They hand out their business card, they make a connection, they pitch their own business because they're learning that constantly. Um, and then, so I'm just middlemaning that process, that's all. Can I get a little more specific? Like, sure. Um, you're an event happening, you volunteer for the event because it's a nonprofit event. Like right. uh, I did a dress for Red heart disease for women and I came in and I gave my makeup skills because right. that was the avenue I was going right. in um, as a person who is freelancer my makeup costs money right. my bag you know what I mean and it all comes out of my pocket you want to do these things because you want to put yourself out there how do you do it like that what, what, and then where do you you know because sometimes they can go to you because you're good at what you do all the time Say that that's the person, okay, we're going to ask Trey because she's good at what she does and she will <clears throat> volunteer. How do you get to the place where you're like, okay, I'm at this place now. I don't get to say yes all the time. Mm -hmm. How do you have that conversation? Yeah, you just that's decide. something that's going. <laughs> you just decide. You know, like you, it's up to you to determine your own value, especially as a freelancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be selective about who you, who you volunteer for, and you don't have to say yes all the time, mm -hmm. you know, and you can do it without burning bridges. You just explain, like everybody else, I have bills that I have to pay. I've already volunteered for you X number of times. I would love to continue this relationship with you. Here's my rate. If not, maybe you need someone who has less experience than I do, who's more willing to do something like this for free, but unfortunately, you know, you just have to stand up for yourself. Like, I think if you're always giving things away for free, then people are, they're going to attach free with you, and that's not the value you want to be placing on your work. Have you a know? rate sheet all the time. Have yeah. a rate sheet yeah. all have the time. Rate sheet. Like, yeah. put it on your t-shirt, like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just, and I'll, and I'll like, hand I'm it not, out. Not, you're, you're, worth, you're, you're, you're worth something. And I, I have that happen where sometimes somebody's like, oh, I'll do this for you for free or something. I'm like, I don't know. No, you need to you need to get paid for this. This is important, yeah. and it's like, it, it, it's just you, you you need to make sure that you set yourself up in in in, in this way, in in that you set a precedent for yourself mm -hmm. where. If you are going to be giving your time for free, you better be asking for a credit nonprofit form that you can then report to your taxes sure. that you're saying that you just donated three hundred dollars worth of time and makeup of your time and get that taken off of your taxes. Mm -hmm. That's that's what you should be doing, number one. And and if they're and if they're not able to get you that, they're not a nonprofit and you should not be volunteering your time. Look for those other entry points too that are like, you know, is my lab is my logo up at the top saying mm -hmm. that I'm doing this? Are you going to put an email blast out to your customers saying that I gave this service that might lead to some more service for money? So there's those other op avenues too, and I know you probably have some answers. I don't know. I just, I just want to throw one thing in there. So for context, I quit my job as a teacher two years ago, right, in September. And I think everybody that has been through this journey realizes that it takes you know, twice as much money and twice as much time, right? 
And right now, you're probably feeling like, man, I've been putting in enough, so much time and giving away so much of my genius for free that you're like, man, I'm getting tired of doing this, right? But I honestly believe that when you continue to push forward and continue to give away that genius, people are going to start recognizing that you are the best in your craft. And because they see it around so much, they're like, we have to go hire her. We need the best in this industry. So then they find you. So I would really encourage you to continue to do exactly what you're doing. Added, you know, term sheets and all that stuff. Um, but like, it's going to shine. It's going to showcase. You are going to become the leader in that space, in this ecosystem. And I guarantee you, if you are the best at what you do, you can be knitting, you know, yarn, whatever. It doesn't matter. If you're the best at it, somebody's going to want the best to create something, and that person's going to be you. So just keep pushing. Good. And I will say, Trey, you are really good at what you do. So, uh, so we're going to wrap up now, because we're already over. Oh, sorry. I'm so we're okay. All right. <laughs> uh, but I just want to have a chance to give each of you to tell, uh, ask for this room or for the Giant Steps family, what, what do you need from this group? And you have to, you have to say something. Because <laughs> we're, you know, the no. Minnesota folks. Of course, of course. Uh, well, number one, if you are ever in need of a, a free meal or just some community space where you just want some awesome home-cooked Latin American cuisine, um, obviously, this is like, I have a restaurant. Um, it's open six days a week. But if you um, just honestly don't, like, if you're having a hard time and you just, like, want to either A, volunteer your time or just need to be surrounded by good people and have a free meal, without question, the last Monday of every single month, um, from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., I just host a free meal at my restaurant. I'll just leave some cards out here. There's some info also in the package. Please, I would love to see anyone there and just come by. I'm always there every single time, and I love to talk to people. Let me know that, that, I, that you were here and all those things. And it's just, it's just a, it's my favorite day. And um, if you could realize as well that you yourself have so much ability to give back to someone. I've had so many different examples today that I'm writing down as to how one person helped out another person just inspire and push them to that little bit, how they were there for another person, how they were just the voice to back up that, you know, that other person's like idea. Um, just that this is, this is, this has been great and just kind of continue to be that second voice, I would say. Okay. Uh, for me, it's uh, please, when you get a chance, visit teamstudios.org. So T-E-A-M studios.org. Or you can go to my website, youthlens360.com, and you'll find this, this amazing, uh, you know, what we call Wakanda place that we're going to build around <laughs> teens and tech and, and um, entrepreneurship. So just check it out and see if it interests you. And the last thing is, as adults, as older people, go talk to a young person and don't try to teach them anything. Learn from them. Like, it's invaluable. Learn from them. I'm telling you, there's... You guys just, you'll learn something. That I trust me on that. Um, okay, so I have two asks. I am looking to meet anyone who has any experience in publishing a book, whether it's self-publishing or if you've had a publisher or, you know, literary agents, any of those things. I'm looking to learn more about that. Perfect, I love that. Mm -hmm. And then my second ask is because I'm Canadian, please vote, because I don't have a say in what happens, uh, so you all have to vote for me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you should talk to Dara Beavis, too, yes. who's, been, who's been here before. She owns Wising and Publishing. She's, oh, she's, she's, she's great. She's published multiple Giant Sips. Yeah, before, but for she's sure. met at Giant sure. Sips. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so uh, your second ask was going to be my first ask. And then more specifically, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to make sure you vote um, in certain races. Um, the, if you live in Hennepin County, um, we have a chance to replace our awful race as sheriff, and you should vote for Dave Hutch, if you should vote for Mark Hazy for um, Hennepin County Attorney, because he can make a lot of changes to our justice system, and you should please vote for Keith Ellison for Attorney General. Mm -hmm. nice. And you're also working on Ilhan's campaign. Well, I'm working on Ilhan's campaign, but you better be voting for Ilhan. Yeah. <laughs> if you live in her district. If you live in Which CD5, yeah, yeah, you better be voting yeah. for it. Do you have, okay, is that? That's all. I okay. feel like you all know about the other races, but like, yeah, those yeah. are my big ones. That's great. I, and yeah, that message of voting is really important for all of us. Thank you all. We're uh, butting up against the next panel. So, uh, and thanks for moving in, you guys. <laughs> um, I hope this was useful. Everybody will be around for a little while, at least. Hopefully, some of you through the happy hour, right? So that's part of what the happy hour is for, is to be able to continue some of these conversations. And uh, thank you to all of you for coming here, for sharing your stories. It's really important. Thank thanks you. For thank you so much. Yeah.